I'm gonna, uh, since Anna has decided to present today, put her uh, in the hot seat. So this is a scenario of a baby born at 22 weeks of gestation. Potentially it's a pregnancy, my apologies, for a mother. Uh, singleton pregnancy, 450 grams. It's a baby boy. Let's uh, assume she's gone into early labor and actually she is in a level three center. No other risk factors for sepsis. Her partner is unavailable at this particular point. Uh, she's come straight to a and &E. A and &E have given you a call saying that actually she came in with quite significant abdominal pain and actually she was unaware that she was pregnant. They obviously have done appropriate testing, referred her to labor ward. Uh, and uh, at this particular point of time, uh, they've called you to kind of make you aware. Now, the labor ward coordinator has then called back and kind of said to you, uh, she's arrived, we've made an assessment. Uh, this is our assessment based on our current ultrasound. Uh, so how are you going to approach this? They want you to come and speak to the mother. Anna, we're gonna have, you'll have to unmute yourself. I'm so sorry. All right. Um, so I guess you'd ask uh, a few other questions in case uh, they had some information about any other risk factors. So in terms of whether this mother has any other medical problems, has been using any substances that might be a problem. Um, and they've mentioned that they've done a scan now. So I guess uh, presumably they can't see anything that they would be worried about in terms of congenital anomalies. Nothing like that. Um, no so I guess I would want to initially I want to consider the gestation and I would be a bit um, I would be a bit hesitant to rely on this heavily because this is a gestation that's being calculated on a scan being done now. So post um, so post 14 weeks. Um, so I don't think we can extrapolate too much from that if it was a reliable gestation in that she'd had the normal antenatal scanning then again I would say it's a poor prognostic factor that it's 22 plus zero as opposed to 22 plus five. Um, singleton is a positive thing. Um, uh, the other positive things are that there's no risk factors for sepsis um, and she's in early labor so there is a possibility we might get some steroids and mag sulfate on board in time um, and then the poor prognostic factors um, being obviously that this is a little boy. Um, so um, I guess I'd want to weigh up those risks and then I think the conversation with mum would be the most important thing given the, the background situation of it, this being a undetected pregnancy um, and I think that would be a difficult conversation not only because this mum's presumably in shock um, but also because she doesn't have the dad there to support her. Um, so I appreciate that you don't have much time in this situation, but I think from the initial conversation, you'd want to glean enough of her sort of impression and inclination to decide whether steroids and mag sulf is something you need to get on and do quickly. Um, and then perhaps, depending on how things progress, you might have time to then have a further conversation after you've taken that measure, if it looks like there's a possibility that parents are going to be for active management. Fantastic. So really good thoughts there. And I think you've hit the nail on the head. I've made this a little bit harder by kind of saying this is an unplanned pregnancy. So we don't quite have an LMP. She can't remember that. Uh, clearly, this is not a dating scan. And this is a scan that's done very late in pregnancy. Now, what we know is that if you have a dating scan that's done, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> say between 11 and 13 weeks of gestation. Again, that has a kind of uh, uh, a plus minus five days kind of average. So, you know, if you'd had a scan at that time, this baby could have been uh, 21 plus two, uh, or it could have been 22 plus five. Uh, now, clearly we've got a scan, which is much later on, which then makes those uh, intervals even more uncertain. And, uh, you know, for all purposes, this baby could be 21 weeks or it could actually be even 23 weeks of gestation and it puts us in a very difficult situation. Now that's one aspect so we've looked at and this is something that I would like you to approach very carefully so I would always want you to make sure that you've you've qualified with your midwifery colleagues and the obstetric uh, colleagues a dating scan has or has not been done and that you verify dates yourself. 
absolutely essential. So I've been in situations where, uh, you know, I've been counseled and said, well, she's 22 plus five. We'd like you to come and speak to her. And, you know, we've reached the labor ward, had a look through the notes and actually she's 24 plus five. Oops. Okay. So, you know, mistakes do happen. And I think it's really important that you've got those facts. So a certain amount of, I would say, going through the notes, looking for any additional factors, uh, which Anna's rightly alluded to. So is there anything else that makes the risk worse? Now, these are some of the elements that the BAPM document has quantified. And that there's plurality, sex, steroids. Uh, there's clearly uh, <clears throat> some aspects that we haven't been able to quantify in that document. Sepsis, chorea, neonitis, a prolonged rupture of membrane, say, for example. And these are things that would potentially make the prognosis for this particular mother-baby dyad much worse. Now, how are we going to address this? So uncertain gestation, where, uh, you know, singleton 450 grams. So let's go back to the bathroom documentation. Let's see what and how we would address this. So just... Putting you on the spot again, Anna, where do you think this baby lies? And are we assuming that that, that gestation is right? Very good. So you can't assume that gestation is right. So have you been able to read what they talk about when the gestation is uncertain? Um, I can't specifically recall, no. Okay. So what I'd say is that at this particular point, let's assume that the most accurate information that we have is this baby's 22 weeks because that is the information at hand and if we look at that information at hand and we look at the kind of risk assessment the visual tool for refinement of risk i mean at 22 weeks being a boy uh, obviously uh, being 450 grams uh, quite small in a tertiary center so points in favor obviously would be the fact that we can still give steroids we are in a tertiary center obviously points that treat risk are very early in the 22 week kind of pathway uh, and we're a boy uh, which is incredibly small so in my mind you know I would class this baby as being extremely high risk and if I look back at the decision making strategy uh, they say that life-sustaining treatment should not be provided confirm management with the parents now the entire premise here is that you have a palliative focused approach to management so this is a recommendation of practice that they've made my slight worry is obviously we have to talk to the parents and when we talk to the parents, we've got to talk about survival chances, the risk of disability. But what I'd say is this is a very depersonalized way of doing it. I'm making an assumption before I go into that conversation about where it's going to happen, who it's going to happen with, who's going to be there with mom. It's three o'clock in the morning. Obviously, the midwifery team is very concerned that this is a mother and early labor might actually go on her partner is not with her we do need to have some kind of a conversation with her at this particular point if she's in full-blown labor now what do we think about this chart at the moment so this is what i've got i've got two charts here one from the nichd uh, database which looks at survival for a baby at 22 weeks 450 grams males having been given steroids singleton birth and they talk about a survival range of about an average of 7%, but you know, four to 12%. So kind of looking at one in 10 babies, potentially making it through at this particular point. Whereas if you look at the BAPM infogram at this particular point, it says that about three in 10 babies will survive. Now that's quite a significant difference in numbers. You know, if somebody says, my baby's got a 30% chance of survival versus just a 10% chance of survival. So there's quite a disparity there. Now, this is a huge data set. This is based on thousands and thousands of babies. Again, I wouldn't be able to quote, and I will get for you the literature behind it when we speak next time, as to what proportion of those babies would be 22 weeks of gestation to get a little bit of an idea. But interestingly, it gives a very high risk of having neurodevelopmental impairment in the moderate to severe range, as high as 80%. And when you read the BAPM framework, so if I just highlight that, What it says here is that at 22 weeks, one in three babies has severe disability, two in three do not. So actually what it's alluding to is that about 66% of babies at this particular point may actually be neurologically intact. Now, I'm gonna bring you back to the talk I did yesterday. This is talking about the start of pregnancy. It includes all births and it includes the potential outcome that stillbirth might be an outcome, that this baby might die 
it might die in delivery suite. Whereas over here, what we're talking about is we're talking about survival for babies who have active stabilization, who receive resuscitation, who you're likely to then take to the neonatal unit. So actually they're two very different data sets which are giving different pieces of information. Now for me, what I would like to know above all, leaving these figures out of it at this particular point is, there's a very big question about why this mother is not aware that she's pregnant her partner is not with her is it fair to have a conversation with her in the absence of a partner maybe she wants to have that conversation without a partner does she want to have that conversation at all at this particular point of time what's her frame of mind so if i leave all of this out of the equation there's a lot of other factors that i have to think about before having this particular conversation so i'm keen to know from you we've looked at the figures side of things but i'm just very keen to know from you is what approach you're going to take? What are you going to do? How are you going to have this conversation? Where, with whom, who do you want around? Do you want the partner to be in on this? Do you want to speak to her alone? Let's talk about that. So Anna, I'm going to put you back on the spot for that. Um, so in terms of having a partner there or not, I think um, I'd want to ask her that. So what her preference is. Um, and if she says, no, I don't want to talk, I want to wait till my partner gets there, um, I would obviously agree to that, but um, highlight to her that we might not have control over when this baby comes out. Um, so I think that would answer that question. And then I, it's a tricky balance of very much being led by mum and not rushing her into a conversation she's not ready to have, but being clear about the fact that when babies are 22 weeks, they can be born very quickly. So she might have a limited time window in which to have that conversation. Um, and I think the key thing is, um, which can be tricky, obviously, if you're having to run down to A&E and you've got a busy NICU to look after, but it has to be on her time frame or potentially the baby's time frame, not on yours. Yeah, fantastic. I think what you've alluded to very nicely is, you know, there might be anxieties about mum having a partner around, especially in the context of her pregnancy at this particular point. So it's really individualizing and personalizing this conversation to what she wants. And I think that is an absolutely crucial part of antenatal counseling. And what you'll find more and more is we're moving away from uh, what we would call just guidance and an approach which basically generalizes that we talk about survival, uh, we talk about choices, to really what we're trying to do is personalize that conversation to that particular mother baby dyad or whoever she wants to be with her at that particular point, thinking about where you're going to have it, how you're going to have it, who else is going to be there with you. And I mean, in these situations, there's a conversation to be had about the fact that she's gonna have a baby at 22 weeks. There is a decision there that she might have to make and actually she might deliver within a, quite a rapid period of time so it's it's a really tricky situation to be in and what i might do in those circumstances is actually talk to the midwife who's looking after mum to kind of uh, explore with her that there is a baby doctor uh, team over here so a doctor and a nurse mm -hmm. or a midwife who are actually available would like to speak to you about the pregnancy and the potential for the baby delivering at this particular point now it if she wants to have that conversation, that's great. Fantastic, because actually it's an important conversation. It's important that you have that in the context of she might deliver. What if she doesn't want to have it? What should we do? What approach do we take? So I'm gonna, I'm, and I'm gonna put Ali on the line for that. So Ali, she, she's, she's in so much shock that she does not want to have that conversation at this particular point. You know, at the moment she can't even digest Um, I mean, the difficulty is, isn't it, is if the baby delivers and um, things aren't looking very good when the baby comes out. Um, uh, so, um, because, you know, you've got your 22 weeker and if it's not really showing, you know, many signs of life, then, you know, you do some basic resuscitation maybe, but you're not going to really advance very far down the line if it's not kind of um, showing uh you know any response to that um and it's very difficult then to have that decision isn't it um 
with mum when you're kind of at the resuscitator really um but I guess if mum won't speak to you beforehand then that's kind of the only thing that you're kind of left with really yeah sorry for putting you on the spot with that so absolutely and one of the things that I might do in those circumstances is actually speak to the midwife and tell her to be completely honest with mum about the potential for very rapid delivery and for the fact that having that conversation with her is going to inform our decision about trying to help her baby if it delivers. There's an important kind of uh, aspect of the discussion that would obviously help us in further management. And in particular, in this situation, it's steroids. The reason for that is if, if, if at the end of this conversation, we imply that we are gonna help this baby and try and give it the best possible outcome, actually giving it steroids is very important. On the other hand, if we come out of that conversation without actually, uh, you know, uh, with mum not wanting resuscitation at 22 weeks, I think we'd support that completely with the knowledge that we don't give this mother antenatal steroids. So there's something about a treatment uh, decision that has to be made. And it's how you coax mum to doing that. And it might be that actually we explore a time frame and kind of say, we're going to give mum a little bit of time. How about, you know, is there something that this can be revisited maybe in the next half hour, hour or so, so that we're not being forceful. So we're personalizing to that situation. We're risk assessing the potential for delivery. In, in an ideal world, what I would say to you is I would like to have that conversation. And the reason I would like to have that conversation is I wouldn't want to be in the situation where the baby pops out. We haven't talked about things and then we're trying to have those discussions while mum is in full blown labor. And I've recently been in that situation and it is a nightmare. So, you know, no choice, confused. What do we do? And then actually what you have to do is it's default resuscitation under the circumstances, supporting the baby to a point where you can then have further discussions with the parents about what is appropriate. So having that conversation beforehand is crucial. Where am I gonna have it? Well, if mum can have it in a quiet room and we have dyads or rooms where mum can be, if she wants a partner there and we can get the partner there in reasonable amounts of time, it would be great for him to be present. I'd always have a, a midwife or a nursing member from my team with me. There are some aspects of, uh, you know, uh, rapport that might be very important. Uh, the midwife might already have a rapport. She might know things. The obstetric team might have counseled mum. So again, what's been said, really crucial. You know, what does she already know? But before going into that conversation, what I'm giving you is a structure which says a dating scan, looking at mum's antenatal history, making sure you have all that information to hand, and then looking at the individual circumstances of that particular mother and the condition, the situation she's in, what information she already has with her is really important. And that takes time. So again, three o'clock in the morning, full-blown labor, you've got bulging membranes and the baby's ready to come out. Time is of the essence. Because not only are you talking about a conversation, your team has to be preparing in the background for the fact that they might be resuscitating this baby. Now, in terms of information gathering and giving, it's really interesting. So what the BAPN document says is that decision making for babies born for 27 weeks should not be based on gestation age alone. So we, we've kind of looked at that and we've looked at the infogram and clearly we've looked at the risk and the approach that we should take for this baby. And it looks as if we're moving towards a kind of a palliative approach. Uh, does anybody disagree with that? Or does anybody feel that actually, you know, when you counsel the parents, what approach are you going to take? So what are you, what, what phraseology, what are you going to say? So one of the things that came up with Anna's conversation is severe disability and how you, you talk about that in such conversations. So I'm just really keen to kind of get an idea about what the BAPM document actually says. And this is actually what it says in the parent information section. It talks about severe disability, uh, not being able to walk or even get around independently, being unable to talk, difficulties with swallowing or feeding, uh, having difficulties with significant health problems, needing frequent visits, uh, needing to attend a separate school, uh, being unable to care for themselves or live independently as they grow up. And it could be all of these, or it could be any one of these. I think it's a little bit woolly to kind of say, being unable to talk, see or hear properly, because that's a little bit subjective. And again, what I'd say to you is that if you look at the data, for babies at 22 weeks, visual problems are quite severe in the Japanese cohort. Blindness is a real problem. 
So, you know, again, if I'm looking in counseling, this mother at this particular point, it's really having an understanding of what her expectations are, what she wants to do. But coming back to your point, when you have that conversation, so how are you going to start? What are you going to start with doing? Leva. Um, trying to get an idea of what mum herself thinks about it. I will, I usually start by asking what their ideas are. Um, because some parents have a very clear idea. I've had the mother who said, well, my baby hasn't got a chance to survive. Um, and others are convinced that their baby, whatever, will survive. And you have to have that in the back of your mind before you start explaining what you think based on the risk factors and actually the situation. Um, okay. So what I would say is that's, that's completely correct. And my approach in the situation is I would go through mom's history as she understands it word for word. I would talk about what we think her gestation is, but the fact that it's uncertain. I would talk about what we know about her pregnancy. And what I'm really trying to do is get a gauge of what her understanding of her pregnancy is at this particular point, that she's got all the facts accurately as they've been displayed. And a simple example is I've been to a, a you know, a, counseling for a mother where clearly the scan uh, report said it was a baby girl but actually it was a baby boy and by going through those details you know uh, during that conversation we were able to iron out that actually somebody had got the sex wrong in the subsequent reports while dictating it now that's really embarrassing when you're in that situation and you're at the forefront of things but just a confirmation of those details is very important and what I'm making a judgment is of is of the effect in that room. Well, what is mum? What's her frame of mind like? What's the state like? Would she like her partner there? You know, is there anything we can do to make this conversation an experience for her that obviously she will remember is my experience, but more importantly, what can we do to support her in those circumstances? Where are you sitting uh, at her level? Small things like that, three o'clock in the morning the lights might be off. You walk into the room. Do you really want to have that conversation in the dark? Well, what if she's really tired and really sleepy? And actually, I'd ask her. I'd have that conversation and say, look, well, I'm going to, is it okay if I sit down here, take a stool next to the bed at her level? Are you happy if we turn the lights on? Or can we turn the lamp on? We'll leave it a little bit dim. Again, introducing myself. And what I'm trying to do at that particular point is actually make and personalize this conversation. I'm Alok, I'm not the baby doctor. I'm not the neonatal consultant. I am actually one of the doctors who might be there to help the baby if it's born. So I'm trying to personalize it as much as possible. A good other question and not the scenario. I mean, this is an unplanned pregnancy, but what I'd like to do is if, if this is a pregnancy, which is very much, uh, I would say, uh, wanted or in uh, progress, is there a name for the baby? You know, is there something that personalizes the baby to them as a mother baby diet rather than treating this as every 22 weeker or 23 weeker? So, you know, if this is Tom, okay, what we're talking about is Tom. We're not talking about the baby or a baby boy. So we're making that experience more personal for her because clearly part of this conversation is not going to be very pleasant. Uh, some of it is going to focus upon the fact that she, the baby's not going to make it out of delivery suite. Uh, so after that, what I would be trying to do is two major things. So there's a conversation at this particular point about choices. And there's a conversation about information with regards to survival and abnormal neurodevelopment. But if this mother is very overwhelmed, my experience is people don't want to actually go into conversations about that really what they want to do is they want to get through this experience as quickly as possible. And your judgment about the amount of information you have to give really relies on how you are judging the environment, her effect, her understanding, and really trying to support her in that situation is very important in encouraging further conversation to move forwards. Now, I'm going to ask you, and these are all your personal choices. So, I mean, what, what do we think this baby's chances are? Um, I think if, it, if it's born imminently, so I always tend to think of it as on my shift or not on my shift, um, then they will only have had one dose of steroids at best. 
Uh, and I'd say that would be a significant risk. Mm -hmm. so, um, I think if it comes in the next sort of couple of hours, then probably pretty poor. If it comes in 20, more than 24 hours time when they've got two doses of steroids and some mag sulf on board, slightly better. Okay. So let's say we've had a discussion. I mean, what do you think you're going to say to mum? I'm putting you on the spot there. Um, so I think if mum's in the position where she wants to have the conversation, um, I think all the things you said about environment and things are really important. And uh, I, I would probably like to ask her what her sort of family setup is at the moment in terms of, you know, does she actually have five other kids and she's a single mum and she's looking after them by herself? Or does she have any experience with premature babies or children, children who have disabilities? Because I think that would probably inform um, what some of her attitudes are going to be. Um, and then uh, I think I would talk her through what we're worried about um, in terms of the risks of him being a little boy and not having had steroids and being at the very low end of gestation and the few things that are that are positive factors um, and then get her thoughts on it and also I think given that she's not sort of actively delivering the baby right now to make the sort of how dynamic the, situ the situation is clear so the fact that we might need to rediscuss if actually she doesn't deliver in the next couple of days because that will be a different situation. Fantastic. So what I'm going to do is, you've hit the nail on the head. It was the content I was after is, is talk a little bit about the Spikes approach. Have all of you heard of the Spikes approach? Okay. So the Spikes approach is an approach that we use in oncology. And it's a really good approach to be able to kind of use in situations like this. What it talks about is situation in which you're going to have the conversation. So where, how, with whom. It talks about uh, the process of information gathering. So what information you're going to need to take in before you actually uh, start that conversation. Uh, it talks about giving information and imparting knowledge to the mother. And clearly what Anna has now gone into is actually providing knowledge empathetically and then summarizing at the end. And the idea from our perspective is in the information gathering or the eye, what we're trying to do is get an idea about one, what mum's understanding is of the situation, how much she knows, what's already been said, but also her effect before we impart a lot of information. The two key things in this conversation are there's a choice to be made. And clearly that is something that I want to emphasize. And then really what I want her to understand is the risk of uh, the baby not making it through resuscitation, you know, the risk, uh, the journey through the neonatal unit, but more importantly, I think the burden of suffering this baby might have to go through in order to make it through the neonatal unit with the risk of having disability later on. And then what I would, I would try to do is get a little bit of an understanding of, in very lay words, what her understanding of disability is and talk about the potential kind of lay phraseologies to give her a spectrum of what the baby might look like with the knowledge that this is one conversation that I'm going to have to make a judgment about what she's understanding through nonverbal cues, through her body language. And I think if she's becoming overwhelmed, then really I might not even reach that stage. It might be actually, what would you like us to do at this particular point? She doesn't want to go into all that detail. Really, there's a choice to be made. And that choice is about whether she wants resuscitation for her baby or not. Now, when you look at the approach, this is one standardized way of doing it. And I'll share an information sheet of doing it, but it gives you a, a really nice way of doing it in a structured way so that you won't forget these components. And what I wouldn't want to do is kind of uh, not understand what her understanding, you know, if she, and I've been in a situation where I've had some very educated parents. They've had this conversation three times already. It's been done by the local hospital. Uh, they're one of them is a mathematics professor. The other one, uh, you know, teaches physics. Uh, this is clearly a very, very precious pregnancy for them. Everybody has been incredibly pessimistic. They already know what they want. And actually a baby doctor is coming at three o'clock in the morning because they've reached over here to come and have another conversation. I'm the fourth individual in that chain, uh, probably the fifth after the obstetrician and the midwives have had their uh, kind of discussion with them. And I go through all of that again. And really, you know, I've had people come back and say to me, we've been through it. We know all about it. We know what we want. Actually, we'd like you to be there. We want you to resuscitate our baby. 
So the conversation might be as short as that. And what I'm giving you a feel for is that in that you have to still keep to that structure of making sure that this, you've gone through the information gathering, you have accurate information, you've spoken to them uh, and their understanding of the information you have is the same. And the way to contextualize that is to have a little bit of a pre-brief. Now a pre-brief basically means that before I enter the room, I'll have a chat with my obstetric colleagues as well, just to get an idea about what's been said, if it's been said. The majority of the times what happens is it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm the first person having that conversation because uh, my obstetric colleague uh, is busy doing something else. But this is a really generic approach that you can apply and don't forget to take somebody in with you. But the second aspect of that information gathering exercise is mental modeling. And I can't emphasize enough how we don't think about this. Now, there's a choice that this mother has to make at 22 weeks, or is there a choice? So I'm gonna ask you all, what do you feel? So Charu, should we be the, I mean, should we be making this decision or should the mother be making this decision? I think it should be a shared one. So again, um, what situation you are, so, like your potential decision, you don't want to just recommend that this is what we should be doing. Probably you should give them the options, either single options or more options and get them involved. And actually the decision, it's a difficult decision because again, if you have a very short time before the baby is delivered, whether they have understood what information you have provided, whether they have processed all the data, and in that case, I think preferably if you have a time, it should be a shared decision rather than you recommending. Uh, that probably would be my approach. But in the event, if there's no time, then that the option would be um, to give the sort of assess the baby at the time of delivery. I mean, what, what is the condition of the baby? But ideally it would be involving the parents in the, in the decision making. So we're going to have a little bit of a simulation here, okay? So I'm the doctor and I am talking to uh, the mother at this particular point who's 22 weeks of gestation. Uh, and let's assume the mother is Mrs. Thompson, uh, Jeff is dad, Harry is the boy. <clears throat> so I'm speaking to Mrs. Thompson. So Mrs. Thompson, uh, you've come to uh, in quite uh, advanced labor and you're potentially 22 weeks of gestation. And I'm one of the baby doctors, I've come to speak to you about potential for delivery in the next few hours and you know how we would like to approach that situation. So your baby is 22 weeks of gestation. It's a baby boy, it's 450 grams. Uh, at the moment you haven't had steroids. It's a drug that can actually improve the baby's lungs, reduce hemorrhage and something that will be used to kind of help the baby if we think that's the right thing. But actually one in three babies uh, will survive uh, if your baby's born at this gestation. And there's about a 66% chance that actually your baby will not have any problems if we manage it actively by giving it steroids and actually trying to optimize your pregnancy. Should we go ahead with it? Great, thumbs up. So what I'm giving you a flavor for is, there's a slant that I've given them about being proactive. But the recommendation from the BAPM guidance actually is that it, you know, if you look at the kind of chart at this particular point, it talks about palliative comfort focused care for the extremely high risk. So what I would say is there's a little bit of a contradiction there in terms of the infogram and what's being highlighted about the risk-based strategy. And that's where I would say that it's, it's a really tricky situation. And that's why I come back to this mental model that actually you would have formed a mental model of what you think uh, this baby's chances are. But objectively, actually, if you look at this baby's chances, they're very poor. Now, we have to be honest about that. We also have to give the parents a choice, but is it fair to do that? So the choice that we're, we're, we're asking them to make is that actually this baby has a really, you know, big chance of not making it through delivery. It's likely to spend about 18 weeks on the neonatal unit where we're gonna do a huge number of destructive, painful interventions in order to keep it alive. The first few days are quite critical. It can have bleeds into the brain. It can have problems with infection. Its skin may fall apart. It might actually be in a situation where uh, it then has bleeds into the brain, which make it 
or affect disability. We won't know that actually if, until the first week of life is over. And even after that, it can have problems with uh, injury to the brain, which then mean that your baby could be in a wheelchair later on in life, uh, unable to see, deaf, dumb, blind, unable to eat, uh, dependent on you for uh, you know its, its care throughout. So that's a very extreme blunt way of saying it, which takes me to the opposite end of the spectrum. And you can see how this conversation, you know, I'm being blasé and matter of fact, but I'm just giving you two approaches to how you can skew the conversation in different ways. And this is very important. This is called framing bias. And a, a good way of, of talking about framing bias is looking at the cup and saying that, actually you could say that when you, you talk about this is that three in 10 babies survive, 33% chance that your baby's gonna make it. And actually there is a 66% chance that your baby will not have a severe disability. So actually the way you're selling that conversation is very positive. On the other hand, you could say that actually, while if, if we really helped your baby and we optimized your pregnancy, there is a, you know, a, a 70% chance that your baby is going to die despite our best efforts. You know, we can do everything we want, but seven in 10 babies will die. And there's a real risk that, you know, one in three babies will be blind, will not be able to hear, will be disabled, will be in a wheelchair, will not be able to, you know, will be dependent on you for their entire life, might actually die very early on, might not survive to the age of five, and, you know, will have a lot of suffering on the neonatal unit. So you can put this conversation in two different ways. Now, the ethics about that is what I'm very interested in having a discussion with you about. So trust me to say, uh, it's, it's perfectly okay at this particular point to have any kind of views and any kind of uh, approach, but I'm just really keen to kind of see to, from your perspective, what approach you'd like to take. Do you think either of these approaches is honest and transparent? Ali, let me put you on the spot. I don't know, I feel a bit uncomfortable with kind of framing the conversation in such a way that it kind of sways the parents um, down one route, really. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're saying is obviously we don't want to sway the parents. Yeah. What we're also saying is we want to give them completely honest, transparent information. And the real fact is we don't know. You know, for this individual baby, coming back to Anna's slide, is the fact is I just don't know. I'm not certain about any of these things. So actually what we've got to avoid and what is put beautifully in the BAPM document is this concept of uh, framing bias. And actually what is important is that we're giving the parents a feel of what happens to babies who are born at this gestation, but an understanding that we are by no means certain that that is the case for them as a mother baby diet at this particular point and that actually future outcomes are uncertain and that we, we don't have enough data in the UK to guide us, but from whatever little data we have, really the worries from our perspective are the high risk of this baby not making it through delivery suite. The one thing that is very certain is the amount of, I would say, painful procedures. You know, a lot of what we're gonna do on the neonatal unit is very certain. Again, some of the morbidities are uncertain. Now, how much of that information you convey in a half an hour uh, conversation with the parents and what they take on board, that is really, really hard to gauge. And I'm going to be honest with you to say that it's very difficult to then say that you should have a structure and that you have to say this amount of stuff as a bare minimum. But two things that are very important is that we do need to have an understanding about what the parents want. That's crucial. I would really want to make sure that, you know, from my perspective, the parents have a choice here. That is one thing that's important. But more importantly, how much information can I give them for them to make an informed choice without overwhelming them? And that might mean that actually they're so educated, they've had this conversation three times before, their understanding is that actually there's a very high risk that the baby's not gonna make it and there is a very high risk of disability. But under the circumstances, they want me to give their baby the best possible chance. And actually, since they've had that conversation, once I've got a clear understanding that they've got the information that was necessary to make that decision, it's not going to be a 30 minute conversation with them. On the other hand, it might be a young, vulnerable mother who's found out that she's just pregnant 
and giving her all that information might be very overwhelming. But clearly, because she has a choice to make, I have to convey that information sensitively and in a way and in an amount that I don't overwhelm her and she's able to make that choice. I would try to make a judgment about her language, be as lay as possible, as lay as possible, so that you know I'm really giving her things that she understands. And what I'm making a judgment of is, is who's making that decision. So one approach is that she has complete parental autonomy and the mother and father make that decision. One approach is that I'm right. We call that medical paternalism and I'm making that decision for them. And what I would say to you is that what you've really got to do is make a judgment about where the parents are. So there's a concept which is called beneficial paternalism. And beneficial paternalism means that there are some parents who would want to make that choice after the information you give them. That informed choice is something that they want to make. It's their decision. And it's really how you shepherd them into making the right choice based on the information that you've got so that you're making the decision with them. They're making that decision. And that's one form of shared care. On the other hand, there will be parents who basically from our perspective, cannot make that decision because they feel guilty about it. It's not fair. It's a really big decision for them to decide whether you should resuscitate their baby or not. And actually in those circumstances, it's about then making a judgment about whether that is the case and actually then taking a little bit of the burden of decision-making off them so that they don't feel guilty. And again, I would say that that's shepherding them. What I would say is that in the first situation, it's shared care. You're honest, transparent, and you're getting them to approach that situation in a manner that empowers them to make a decision because that's what they want to do. But if they don't feel empowered to make that decision because it's a huge decision and they feel guilty, then actually it's about offering them the choice in a manner that they feel that you're actually making that decision for them because you're the person who's medical. And it's understanding that. And that is really difficult. And I can't emphasize to you how difficult I find it. Every conversation is different. Every parent is different. The circumstances are different. It's so difficult. Some parents don't want to have that conversation at all. They just, you know, just do what you think is right for my baby. And actually, really, that is a huge amount of information in itself because I can go through all of this, but actually, what are they going to take on board? You know, I am making this really difficult for them. And it's making that individual judgment. How do I structure that? So a lot of it is nonverbal skills and communication. I will listen to them a lot. I will talk to them a lot. And, you know, I might, I might talk to them about what their understanding is and uh, really, you know, what their understanding of disability is, because they might be more interested in that than actual survival. On the other hand, there might be some parents who just don't want to go there. They don't want to talk about disability or the risk of having problems later on in life. What they're more interested in is whether their baby will survive the next two hours or not. And actually, in all honesty, this is a very high risk situation. My experience of the situation is that, you know, there are babies who will actually die despite our best efforts at resuscitation. What I'm doing is I'm taking away from all the data that we discussed yesterday, all the figures, that card that I have at the back of my pocket when I was a registrar, and actually thinking about this baby as an individual and talking about its chances when I start resuscitation. And what I'm definitely objective about is, there's a possibility this baby might be born and will not make it through a cessation. There's a possibility it might be born and it might come to the neonatal unit and it might go through a huge amount of, uh, I would say, intensive care. So if I describe that in lay words, we'll be putting lines, we'll be giving this baby painful uh, stabs. You know, <clears throat> we, we will be nourishing this baby. There's very high risk of infection. So there's a huge journey. And there's a lot of suffering that these babies have on the neonatal unit if they were to survive with the risk that they might have complications. Having that conversation, I'm, I'm looking at mom's body language and the parents' body language. I'm making a judgment of how they feel about it and then asking them actually, you know, in this situation, what would you like me to do? There's a choice. Now, the difficulty is how do I make a judgment about which parents want to make that choice and which parents want me to make that choice for them? And I'm gonna put this back to you and say, do you have any strategies for that? If you get that far. Anything that comes to mind? 
I haven't got a real strategy to find that out, but a lot of things on how parents think about who has to make the decision also depends on the context and the situation where you're in. Because, I mean, I, I most recently, well, last year, so I've been working in the UK and how parents think about making these decisions is completely different from when I used to work in Belgium, which is between 2010 and 2015. If in Belgium a baby was born then at 24 weeks, you as a doctor would say, we're going to do this and this and this, or we're not going to do this and this and this. And parents would actually expect you to say so. If I would go there and ask, what do you think? I would get a blank face and say, well, that's your job, not mine. It's probably evolved now, but in the UK, parents are much more involved in decision making. Uh, that was one of the things I really had to adapt to when I started working here. But so, yeah, it also depends on where parents are from. So that's fantastic. So previous conversations might help you in this situation. They might have a view from having discussed this with a previous clinician in a level one or two center. The obstetric team might have been able to gauge some of that. You know, it might be that the midwife comes back and says, well, the parents do have views and actually they would like resuscitation in these circumstances. So actually that's giving you a feel for things. But it might be that actually you don't have that feel. And the way to phrase it, an, an approach that I've kind of learned over the years from looking at older, wiser people who taught me was giving the parents the scenario and saying that actually in this circumstances, some parents might want that we don't uh, actually, you know, help the baby so that they can have quality time with the little one. So you're giving them the kind of circumstances, you're talking to them about the potential for choices. And, you know, that would be perfectly acceptable. And that would be, uh, and that is, you know, in my mind, what you try to highlight at that point is that that is actually care, that we have not stopped caring at any particular point, that actually in that process, if, if we decided to go down the route of comfort care, it would be an opportunity for them to have special time, cuddle, have warmth with their baby. And actually in those circumstances, you know, that is something that in my experience, and this is personally my experience of having witnessed those situations, you know, babies, uh, I've not seen things that say to me, at least personally, that would convince me that they suffer by not having resuscitation. Actually, I've seen them comfortable. I've actually seen them on their mother's chest. Again, it's getting an idea and getting, giving them uh, a, a kind of an idea of how that might look. And at the same time, kind of saying that some parents might actually want us to go through and help the baby as much as we possibly can. And then if we get through that period of helping the baby at the start and it does well and we're able to get into the neonatal unit, it's looking at the baby each day at a time. Because actually from our perspective, there might be things that then develop that give us more information about our ability to then be able to counsel them about whether we should carry on intensive care. The fact that we are, you know, or they want us to help the baby doesn't mean that it consigns us to having to help the baby for that entire duration. And that might actually be, uh, you know, something the parents do want. They want us to go through with resuscitation. And then, you know, if the baby has an IVH, they might want us to stop. So you're offering those choices in a manner that they understand that they have a choice. And then if you look at parents, some parents will come and say, well, what do you think? What would you do if it was your baby? So I'm going to put that back to you. How are you going to answer that question? Charu, if somebody asks you that question and says, well, you've offered us the choices, uh, you know, about what parents might do it or not do in those circumstances. So can I, uh, can we, can we ask you if it was your baby, what you would, you, you would do, how would you approach that? Very difficult question. <laughs> uh, but I would all, say with particularly with this 22 weeker um, with the all the different scenarios and what we have at the current situation without steroids without maxel and very limited number of babies for the outcome and um, we would prefer for, i would prefer myself for the palliative care which i would more spend time with comfort with the baby in the last few whatever time i get with um, that probably would be my sort of um, my views on this particular gestation and this what at present situation um, again it's a little bit difficult because you are then they may say oh this is what you do then I would also do the same 
but at the same time we have to make it clear that it is your entirely your decision it's your baby and what you prefer um do you think that might make them feel very guilty actually it's our decision it's such a big decision to make how do you get them across that any anybody else want to have a go at that any how would you approach that unless they have want to have support with other other family member they want to discuss or if they are religious they want to discuss with the with the priest or some support what they probably rather than blaming themselves or us um whether we can provide at that time could be one of the option okay so one of the things that the bapun document highlights is the importance of being honest and transparent now in all honesty i've never been in that situation is it fair for me to share my personal experiences of how i might react to a situation where i've never been in that situation it would be unfair for me to share that's my personal view on it and in that kind of situation i i'm really honest and frank with the parents and kind of say actually i have never been in that situation and really in all honesty i don't know how i would react until i'm actually put in that situation but i think it's about acknowledging that this is a very difficult situation that they're in it's using those words to kind of talk to them about the fact that you know i can't imagine being in your shoes at this point and then bringing them back to those choices and kind of saying well you know these are the choices and what you really want to do is make them feel comfortable with all those options you don't want to bring a hint of paternalism into you must resuscitate actually by not doing it you're not giving the baby a chance nor do you want to bring in the approach where you kind of say well actually you know uh comfort care is the way to go because actually you know the majority of these babies are going to die or they're going to be severely disabled so you want to keep that kind of those nuances those innuendos out of it and actually try and see if they can make that judgment and then if they can't make that judgment really and they want you to make that judgment for them then i think what would happen is you would go back to talking about the facts and i mean experience says i've resuscitated 122 weaker i've already seen three who've not made it out so that's 25% and i'd have to quote my experience on it and i would say that i would support them through that decision making process but actually if you know my worry is the amount of intensive care and the suffering this baby would suffer to get it out of the neonatal unit with a very high risk of having problems later on in life and i would be very honest with how severe those problems might be and very late and then again try and see if they can make that decision but at the end of it i would probably allude to the fact that comfort care is you know it's it's it doesn't mean that we stop caring it's really important to know that we keep babies comfortable we allow them to be with mom there's some parents who might find that really frightening they would just not be able to do that what does the baby look like well you know it's very fetal you know i've had a couple from a different country who were absolutely certain they did not want to see or be with their baby after birth they just wanted us to take it away to a different room so you know i think what you can see is i'm being a little bit woolly over there but really what i'm trying to get across to you is what you're really trying to make a gauge for is what choices the parents have made and some of that is after you've given some information sometimes not all the information because the parents get overwhelmed every conversation is different in terms of a framework what i would say is what is very important is that you stick to a framework and i would say that it's really important that you've done the information gathering that you approach this as a multidisciplinary team at the lower gestations some of these decisions might mean giving mom a scar you know at 24 25 weeks for a girl who's steroided who is 700 grams you know the question is do i want to risk head entrapment so that concept of doing a cesarean at that gestation might actually come across and it might be the right thing on the other hand at 22 weeks to give mom a classical cesarean scar for a baby who's got high risk of disability you know a high risk of non survival that that's not fair so it's really important to keep a combined approach and i can't emphasize this enough that there is nothing more embarrassing than entering a room where your obstetric colleagues have said something the midwife has said something and you're saying something diametrically opposite the conversation goes up in the wind and really there's a real risk the parents will lose trust 
have a discussion. I call that a pre-brief. I will talk to them. I will make sure that I know what they've said, what the understanding of the parents is. And when I go into that room again, what is the situation? Who do I have with me? How comfortable are the parents? What the environment is like? What is the parent's perception of what's been said? What, what is their understanding? That's what the P stands for. The I in the K, I think, is for information gathering and imparting knowledge with empathy and then summarizing at the end. And the idea is having that approach, what I'm trying to do is get a feel of the following things. When I leave that room, what I'd like to do is try and give as much information that I think they can understand within that conversation, get an idea about what their expectations are, have a little bit of a thought of what I think might be right for that baby at that particular point. And it might be that actually, uh, and I, I think this is a better question to address after the next scenario, uh, but also talk to them about the options of what we might or might not be able to do as a team. And I think this is really important for level one centers, you know, where a 22 week is delivering, you know, two and a half hours away from a tertiary center, the outcome for resuscitating a baby like that is going to be very difficult. And really, you know, as much as we try to, I, I really worry about situations like that. So it, it's having a discussion about those things, especially if parental expectations are that at 22 weeks, we're going to be able to do everything to give their baby a really good outcome. And that might come up in the conversation. And then it's how we support or enable decision making, depending on whether they feel able to make a choice or not. And some of that will bring in this concept of beneficial paternalism. So where does this concept come in? So let me just give you the last scenario. And I'm gonna ask Lever to have a go at this. So 23 week girl, she's a singleton. She's 500 grams. Uh, there's a dating scan, which was done at 11 weeks. Uh, this is an incredibly precious pregnancy. Uh, the mother is coming to about 42. She's had numerous cycles of IVA, IVF. She's had, uh, and had a miscarriage. And because she's had a miscarriage, we're kind of in the situation where uh, this is a very, very precious pregnancy for her after this conception. Uh, clearly, it's not been all hunky-dory during the pregnancy in that she had gone into and had some contractions around 20 weeks, but at 13 weeks, she had rupture of membranes. And what is very clear on the scans from 20 weeks onwards, where they've been assessing is this absolutely no liker. There are no other risk factors for sepsis. There are decreased fetal movements. The baby's not moving. Uh, and we're kind of in a situation where uh, she's gone into quite full-blown early labor. So Leva, how are you gonna approach this? And I'm happy to be the mother. Well, I um, would ask my midwifery and obstetric colleagues what they've already said about because they are clearly already aware that there is a ruptured well a problem since 13 weeks and anhydramnios. So have they said that to mum? Is she does she know what that means? So very good. So the obstetric team went in and they've spoken to mum and they've said that you know there's a very high risk that the baby is not going to have lung development. I think the main worry at this particular point is, uh, you know, she is with no like her and having such a long rupture of membranes, you know, her care and her health takes primacy over everything else. And at this particular point, because she's in early labor, I think their aim is to try and stop and see if they can get her out of this by giving her a tocolytic. But actually, if she were to deliver, you know, they've said that the chances for the baby are extremely low for surviving this. Oh, and has there also been a chat about giving steroids or has she had steroids already? So she's, uh, the, the obstetric team were kind of keen for us to explore what we think about that and have not given us steroids yet. Okay. Um, well, I would obviously also check, is there anything else in the pregnancy and, and that we need to know? No, just, just had miscarriages. It's a very precious pregnancy, IVF, but no other health problems. No, okay. And the partner is around and... Yep, the partner's with her. Yeah, okay. And mom wants to have a chat with us or... Well. Yep. Actually, okay. she's, she's a little bit upset about the way the obstetricians have dealt with things. Mm -hmm. she, she feels that actually they've been quite pessimistic. <laughs> okay. 
okay um that so i think we've we've gathered the information we grossly need i mean obviously i would read the notes but um so then i would go in with either a neonatal nurse or if the, if she's in labor there will be a midwife assigned to her we will be following the whole process so i think that midwife should actually know what we are saying as well um so it's maybe more of more use to take that midwife than a neonatal nurse at this point i think but worst case they can both come although most parents don't like too many people there yeah um so i would go in and introduce myself um and and whoever has come with me um if parents don't know that person yet um and i would um obviously confirm that she's pregnant and in labor and her baby is a girl. Um, she's 23 weeks pregnant and that's based on a dating scan at 11 weeks and, and see if she confirms that she's 23 weeks or that she thinks it's something else um, or not. And also I would definitely ask um, that we've been told that there was, that the waters went at 13 weeks and that there is currently no um, like or um, present and I would definitely see her reaction on that and ask her to to explain to me that she knows what that actually means or if somebody has told her what that could be. So both parents are quite categorical. Uh, this is a very precious pregnancy for them. Alice, who is uh, what the, the name that they've given to their little one, uh, has uh, and will make it through. And that actually what they would like us to do is not have any further conversations about this with them. Well, they've clearly, then I would acknowledge that they've clearly thought about um, what their thoughts are um, and that I appreciate that, that they want everything done for Alice, as in reframing or replying in different words what they tell me um, and that we will be present at their delivery then because obviously it's a 23 weeker, it's a girl, it's a singleton. Um, so there are positive factors, but the main negative factors are obviously um, the anhydramnios. So that I understand their ideas, but in this case, then it would be, if they want to do everything, then it would be my recommendation that steroids are given to mum to try and optimize the lung development, because they are already aware that this is not going to be optimal or is actually a high chance this is definitely not good. And I would also recommend magnesium sulfate if they are very clearly stating they want active management. So that will be my start, but I would then obviously say we will be there. We will, at delivery, um, do our best and, and support the little Alice, but we will have to um, go with what she's able to cope with. Um, I mean, if, if she clearly, we can't aerate the lungs or we can't get the heart rate, even if we try, then she has made the decision herself. Fantastic. So, I think the reason I've got the slide up here is, does this make any difference now, considering what you've heard from the parents? So I'm gonna bring Anna into this. So Anna does going through the pictogram or using the NICST calculator. I mean, what's the point? And I think the point I would make is that actually, this is a conversation where the focus is, you know, the long-term outcomes and survival are the least important things for the parents. What is very important for them is what you're doing. So how important do you think it is that they understand this? Um, I actually don't think these parents are going to have an interest or process these numbers. And, and I certainly think in terms of the infogram, um, it's of little value given that these don't factor in a significant sort of period without any lycra. Yeah. Um, so I think um, this is more about uh, appropriately managing this patient's, these parents' journey in order to process what will probably be a bereavement. Um, okay, so that's interesting. Uh, so you feel relatively certain this baby's going to die? I'm, I'd be very worried. <laughs> Not certain, but I'd be very worried. And um, I actually had a question about um, sort of uh, in terms of obviously these parents want everything done. About what we would consider everything in terms of 
if we, you know, we will assess, we'll intubate, they don't respond to intubation, they've probably got pretty awful pulmonary dysplasia. How would you take it in terms of, okay, well, these parents have said, I want everything done. So to me, does that mean I should be doing CPR and giving this baby drug? That is a beautiful question. And that is really the opportunity. So the parents have given you a frame to explore over here. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, the conversation that I'm having with them is their understanding that this baby has a real, real risk of not making it through resuscitation. The most common things in my mind that would happen to this baby in my experience is you try to resuscitate, you intubate, you give surfactant, you, you try hard, they pop. And before you know it, you're going through cycles of drains, you know, very destructive, painful interventions in a situation where I wouldn't normally be offering compression and drugs to a baby. So really, how am I going to convey that to them uh, and actually still make them feel that actually there is and we are doing everything that we can. And a good way of doing that is kind of, as you've alluded to, is saying to them that actually this is what full active management would look like. And, you know, my worry is when a baby doesn't have any like from that time is the lungs won't be formed. Now, in that situation, we will try to help Alice as much as we possibly can. But sometimes in the process of doing that, we put a tube in, we give soap like material to expand the lungs. The lungs actually pop. And if they pop, my experience of babies like that is they have very little reserve. And really then what we have to do is we have to put very painful drains in. We have to make incisions in the baby's chest and put those drains in to get the air on. That is really destructive and really painful. And actually that might be Alice saying to us that actually that's as much as I can take. You know, you've tried to help me with the tube and with the soap-like material, but actually my lungs aren't large enough or big enough to be able to help me. So in a way I'm making that decision. And that's an opportunity for you as parents to have time with Alice, where she'll be comfortable with you, where we can leave the tube in and we can help her, but so that she has time to get to you. And, you know, she's then making a decision herself about how much she can take. The real risk from my perspective is that if we do that and she pops her lungs, my experience is babies like that often bleed into the brain. And considering Alice is 23 weeks and 500 grams, there's a high risk of that happening that will then mean a huge amount of, I would say, painful procedures that we would then do on the neonatal unit in terms of stabs, getting lines in. And, you know, the question is, do we think it's the right thing to put Alice through that? So it's leaving those options out there, again, where the parents have that ability to kind of make a choice. Now, what, what I'm doing there is I'm being beneficially paternal here. What I'm doing is I'm giving my experience and I'm giving my honest experience. My honest experience of babies like this is 50% of them don't make it out of our unit. So having looked at that data in our unit in Southampton for babies who have lung hypoplasia, in 50% of the babies that I've managed over the last 20 years, they have needed drains popped. Uh, if I've managed to get a drain and got them to the neonatal unit, they have not done well. And certainly my experience uh, is I've, I've never used adrenal and compressions. Now, if the parents then still want us to carry on, <clears throat> there is an approach you can agree ceilings of care. You know, I would not be giving babies, uh, you know, like that drugs because actually that is them saying to me, I'm dying. And that is where I'm, I'm being beneficially paternal. I'm being honest based on my experiences and review of the literature, but actually what I'm being is beneficially paternal because I really need them to have a clear understanding in that situation of what they're asking for. But at the end of that journey, what I would say to them is that, you know, if we're able to push, pull Alice through this and she has big bleeds in the brain and she survives this, this is the spectrum of disability. And this is how severe it can be. So actually, rather than going into charts like this, which talk about figures and a seven and 10 chance of survival, really what I'm trying to do is have a conversation with them about what I think Alice is going to be like after she delivers. I'm personalizing it to them. I'm personalizing it to their choices. I, I want them to understand the truth, but I am probably being a wee bit paternal there. And this is where I would say to you that, you know, medical paternalism and complete parental autonomy, these are two extremes. Whenever we have counseling and whenever we, we speak to parents, there's an element of both of these that's there. And there's a certain kind of overlap that you're going to have in these conversations. I think the key thing is being honest with the parents about your experience in such circumstances and trying to shepherd them through is the word I would use. 
And again, I come back to this last slide. What am I aiming to achieve? I'm trying to get an idea of the parental expectations, which in this case are, we want to do everything. We want you to do the best you can. But actually there's a ceiling limit about what I agree, I think is right for Laris. And personally, my view would be, I, I probably wouldn't want to put drains in her. I, I certainly wouldn't want to give her drugs. I wouldn't want to give her compressions. And the question is how I convey that to the parents at this particular point in terms of telling her or telling them that actually maybe Alice has a say in this and how I then support that decision making process. They might actually come back and agree that actually, actually if Alice doesn't respond, that's a perfectly reasonable outcome and we want comfort care. On the other hand, they might say, well, we would like you to put those drains in. And then there might be an agreement to say, well, look, if I put the drains in, and I try and Alice, this heartbeat is dropping, then it might be that I actually come back to you and say that she's she's not responding despite our best efforts and that actually now it's time for you to have a cuddle with her. And I leave it there. So there's an element of beneficial paternalism in it that you put into support decision-making. The important thing is that you convey the information as accurately as possible. And my experience is 50% of babies in that situation will need drains in delivery suite if they have anhydramnios. When they get to the unit, you know, a significant proportion will go on to have nitric. I've seen bad IVH with situations like this. I really want them to understand that there's a very big chance that despite our best efforts, Alice is not going to make it and that we might be moving towards comfort care. Clearly, that's a completely different conversation. Last scenario, we're coming to the end. We've got about 15 minutes left. So, <clears throat> you have a, some parents, and I'm going to give this to Charu. Charu, mm -hmm. 25 weeks of gestation. Okay. Uh, this baby is 370 grams. Uh, the parents, from our perspective, you know, there's been quite severe intrauterine growth restriction. Uh, the parents are very keen that... Uh, they, they're very uh, cognizant of the fact they don't want a child with disability. They've spoken to you. Uh, they're in a level uh, in your center. Uh, clearly, they're very keen that the baby's not resuscitated because it's so IUGR. The real worry is there's significant disability. So how are you going to approach counseling? Um, so, of course, I will sort of check their understanding, actually go through the um the outcome data um so basically explaining them um gathering knowledge what they understand and providing them the data what we have over here so if we see 25 week or moderate with um of course and ensuring antenatally and things whether they are aware about all the steroids, et cetera, whether that would help. Um, and despite that, if they uh, have taken the decision that they don't want to um, resuscitate, uh, I would always sort of revisit it. Why, why basically there are data with IUGR with a better outcome as well. It doesn't mean that um, the disability, understanding about their disability, what it means, so I, in, I would try to explore that and try to support in sort of giving them an understanding the data, basically. Yep. So that's really good. So the parents you've spoken to, and they're kind of in a situation where uh, they, they, they've been actually being managed at a tertiary center. They, they live in your catchment, but they've been having regular fetal medicine with Dopplers. The doctors mm -hmm. obviously were not quite reversed at the last scan, but they were very aware that this baby might be in the range of about 340 to 350 grams. Mm -hmm. And that at this particular point, the tertiary center was quite anxious that, you know, if the baby delivers, there might be very little that they can actually do to support the baby. Uh, I think they've been counseled and spoken to by a pediatrician and a medic team. And clearly the plan was to do a further scan in a week's time to assess growth and see where the baby is with a view to having further discussions. So she is in early labor and she's going to deliver. And the parents are quite clear that actually in view of the discussions they've had with the tertiary center, even though she's 25 weeks, 
They were counseled at about 24 weeks with a view to doing a scan at about 26 weeks. But uh, clearly she's come back in early labor now. So they don't want resuscitation. Uh, are you happy with that? And um, not really because um, I, we had similar situation where there was a baby with a significant IVH who was supposed to be fifty side um, and the baby delivered. Uh, but the baby was in a very good condition. And um, so I think it, it's difficult scenario, but I would sort of still, if, if she's in labor and if she's delivered and the baby's condition at birth is reasonable, I would then reconsider and probably rediscuss with them uh, that the situation we understand, but that at this moment when the baby has delivered is in a uh, reasonable good condition and support uh, with, if he's responding well with the minimal uh, stabilization, then I would probably rediscuss with them and uh, re sort of go through the process and get their views before not doing anything. I mean. Okay. Uh, that's fantastic. Anna, any thoughts? Sorry, apologies, Alok, my uh, computer's having issue with sound. Um, could you just repeat what the question was? So did you get the scenario? Uh, yes, yeah. Okay. About the, the question is the parents don't want resuscitation. They're currently in a level two center. Uh, the baby's estimated weight is about 350 grams uh, at 25 weeks. Uh, clearly scans didn't show reverse Dopplers but there were concerns about growth and this mother was gonna have another fetal medicine scan at 26 weeks, but at 24 weeks, she was counseled for a very, very poor prognosis. And the parents had decided at 24 weeks if the baby was born, you know, as small as that, that they would not want resuscitation. She's now 25 weeks of gestation. They're clearly still of the opinion that they don't want resuscitation. The question is, are you happy to support that? Um, I think it's it's, uh, difficult and I'd I'd like to I would like to know whether at the time of the initial counselling it was made clear that obviously the situation would be quite dynamic um, because if not then the parents might have made quite a fixed decision not based on true understanding that actually the situation now if we did another scan could be quite different um, and that there might be new information that might change things so I would definitely want to renew those conversations with them um, and understand their decision-making process a week ago. So I'm getting a flavor over here. So clearly there's a little bit of uncertainty here as to the right approach. So if, if you were to think about what you want to do, I mean, if there's potential time here, what about contacting the nursery center, uh, speaking to them about the situation? The question from our perspective is, do they have a view? B, is, there, is this a situation that might be better with this mother going to the tertiary center if time permits, you know, in utero transfer, further discussions with the tertiary center, a little bit more assessment. And I think my push in this situation would be to try and see if that can happen. Clearly with the knowledge that we and the tertiary center would have a rapport with the parents, they know the parents, it might be that you have clinicians who previously interacted with her who can have these conversations again. And clearly there's a conversation to be had. What I'd like to do is I'd like to leave this as a little bit of homework for you. I'm just very keen for you to kind of uh, make a judgment based on survival for a baby at 350 grams, 25 weeks gestation. So two things that you're gonna look up and you're gonna look up the survival and this is a baby boy. <clears throat> and you're gonna look at potential neurodevelopmental outcomes for this baby. Uh, you can use the NICHT calculator. I'd be very interested if you want to have a search with some Japanese data for babies as small as that or data from the States. But what we're going to talk about over the, the next week to 10 days is we're going to move from survival into neurodevelopmental outcomes and short-term morbidity on the neonatal unit. So we're going to talk about how that comes into the conversation. Now, there's a little bit of method to my madness about this workshop. You know, one of your questions would be, why have we gone into antenatal counseling without actually talking about the risk of neurodevelopmental outcomes and morbidity? Because they're a very important part of the conversation. And again, what I'd say to you is, it's to provide you with a framework of how to approach antenatal counseling rather than 
counseling based on survival figures, numbers, and morbidity. Because as I've alluded to, in at least the latter two scenarios, there is, you know, this makes very little difference if the parents have made a frame or have got a decision in their mind. Really, what, what is important is your approach and how you translate that into practice. And if I summarize, what I would say is, my approach is very much about robust information gathering before I get into that room. It's about making sure I have all the facts correctly, that I know what, not just the gestation is, but actually what all the BAPM factors are that might actually make this baby's outcome good or bad. I would definitely go back to the BAPM kind of risk uh, strategizer and try and look and classify where this baby lies in terms of risk. I will celebrate this uh, kind of approach, but more importantly, I think what I want to then get an idea about is, is where my obstetric team is, what they've said, uh, what we're going to say as a combined team, what we're going to agree together is the right approach for this mother and baby that we might have in our minds. We will talk about it pre-brief so that we can discuss it and then go into that conversation using a little bit of the spikes approach. So comfort, environment, what's mom's affect? How much information do I think she's going to be able to process? Are there particular questions that she wants to get out of the way first? Has she been previously counseled? What's been said? How much information does she want? You know, how much should I give her? I think it's about empathy, nonverbal cues. So something that we will, we will be showing you some simulations of is how you have those conversations. And, you know, it's quite easy to sit in a chair right in front of her or stand over her while she's on the bed and speak to her. And that can be quite intimidating. And really, how, how do you put your chair? Where in it? What's the lighting like? So things like that are very, very important. Don't forget to take somebody with you, somebody who might be able to help you in a very difficult situation. Try to establish a mental model. So A, what choices do the parents need to make? And you need to think of those choices before you enter that room. They may well change depending on the conversation that you have with the parents. Are the parents in a position where they feel able to make that choice with the information that you're going to give them in an accurate, honest, transparent way? Or do they need to be shepherded through to making a choice without trying to make them feel guilty about the decisions they have to make? How you're going to do that? What language you're going to use? You know, it's about offering choices and without alluding to them making those decisions. It's about talking about how other parents may make decisions in those circumstances. And that actually, if there are different ways of doing that, that comfort care is not about stopping caring. It's not about letting babies die. It's actually about looking after babies. But in the end, what you want to do is you want to come up with something that you've achieved from the conversation. And that is about what the parental expectations are with regards to resuscitation and care. If obviously there are expectations that exceed what you think is right for the baby, is there a ceiling of what you can negotiate should be offered to the baby in those circumstances? If not, what you might be able to agree is that you resuscitate and you take to the neonatal unit and then you revisit this conversation at a later time when you have more information. Might be that the parents want to speak to you again and that one conversation is not enough. Might be that a quarter of a conversation was too much for these parents and actually they don't want to look at your face again with the information you've given them. So I can't emphasize enough how each conversation is different. And I can't emphasize enough to you that when I was a trainee and I had these conversations, I used to think they were matter of fact and that just adopting an approach of going through numbers at the back of my pocket and trying to get an expectation of what we think is right for the baby and explaining that to the parents was okay. But actually, Every conversation is an opportunity for you to reflect for each family what personalizes that conversation to them. And I can't emphasize that is much more important for me. It's about how I make that, 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 that bond with those parents about giving them information that enables them to make correct choices based on the information I'm giving them, how I shepherd them through that and how I personalize this to them as a family. That is, that is quite crucial. And that's one approach. And you will hear from Annie, who will be running a workshop for all of you. And uh, Annie is, uh, she's a fierce lady. I, I kid you not. Uh, she, and uh, I love her to bits. But you might find that her approach is very different to the approach that I've followed. And I respect her for that. 
Any questions before we finish? That brings us to the end and we have finished two minutes before time. This was a very long session. I apologize. I'm, I'm glad it was a small group. When you do it with very large groups and I've got to do it with one more group, it becomes really difficult. It sometimes gets a little bit long and drawn, but I think I've given you a flavor for our approach. This will obviously, I'll share this with you and I will share the articles with you that have helped formulate this approach for me. And it's something that I, I don't expect you to, you know, follow what I'm doing, or, you know, I, I trust me to say that this is just a flavor of how one person is doing it. There are clearly better people, wiser people who do this much better than I do, I have much more experience. There are people who are less experienced than me, who have trained locally, whose language and physiology would be much better than mine. I've trained in India. It's taken me a huge, I would say, mountain to climb, you know, in order to bring myself to this situation, I'm, I'm still not as good. And what I would say to you is we learn from each other. I've learned some really good things from all of you today. Uh, clearly, Anna, has, uh, uh, you know, has taught me uh, a lot about the embrace data. And my worry about using embrace data, if I summarize, is very small numbers, no neurodevelopmental outcome data, but then using neurodevelopmental outcome data from 1995 to guide parents, that's quite old. And I think the BAPM framework is lovely and it's beautiful and it gives us a really good way to do things, but it might be that until we have more data that we're a little bit more circumspect about using the pictogram. I, I worry about using that in every situation because a 23 weeker with rupture membranes from 13 weeks, 500 grams of weight, you know, uh, you know, is is probably going to have a very similar outcome to the baby at 22 weeks, as opposed to giving a pictogram and saying that actually at 23 weeks, these are the chances based on the pictogram. Any Anything else you'd like to ask me? Now, just one thing, uh, we're very keen to run a, a session for you guys where you might want to present some ethical cases. And uh, again, I'm very conscious that what we don't want to do is kill you. You're not going to be able to attend every session going forwards. All of these, so the workshop today is, is not live and is not recorded. The idea is there's no point in doing that. Otherwise, I can't get you uh, to be you yourself. So what, what I would say is that if, if there's something else that you think we're not covering in the program, could you just let me know? Because there's an opportunity to do that. We've got till the 15th of May, technically the 22nd of May, before you guys do your MCQ. Again, lots of resources that we'll share with you. But if there's anything we can do to personalize the course to you as a group, anything else that I can do, please do let me know. Is there, sorry, look, is there any forum where we can discuss the cases, like uh, even on the chat or even on the... You might want to discuss the cases in confidence. I completely understand that. Now, the way to do that is, the best way to do that is, I'm very happy to offer you a personalized session. I, I'm, I'm on annual leave for the next three weeks. So if you want to discuss any cases that you feel confidentially, you would struggle to discuss in a forum. And I completely recognize there will be cases like that where we can't have free and frank and open discussions in a forum like this with other people around. The best way to do that is email me and we can fix a time and we can discuss them. And I'm but really what I'm saying that in the forum, we can for different views because it may not be a straightforward yes or no, but if you want to get different views from the, is it okay to put it up on the forum, a case for a case? So one way of doing that is you can send the case to me and I can circulate it for everybody. Uh, okay. Or you can put it in the multidisciplinary forum. So we have a forum chat for the ethics, which you put up on the website. My worry about using that is not a lot of people are accessing it at the moment, looking at the traffic. So it might be easier for you to put that as in a small case for PowerPoint presentation, which I can then circulate to everybody. And a, a good way of doing that is maybe we can start with that discussion before the next lecture. Does that sound appropriate? You can present the case to everybody and we can then discuss it. Mm -hmm. Would that be comfortable? Yeah, when is the next one? Is it so I basically, I'm. we have to discuss neurodevelopmental outcomes. It's gonna be between now and the 12th of April. It's a date that I've got to decide yet. So okay. are there I'll any- I'll see if I can attend because of my clinical okay. commitment. So, what I was going to say is, guys, if you want to give me some dates that uh, you would like us to do that session, why don't the four of you email me? And I'm very happy to work around you because I'm free for the next three weeks. What I'd say is that I was planning for the 8th of April uh, in the evening. Okay. 
So have a think if you guys can't make it for that session. And again, the idea is what we would be doing is having more of a workshop. So just a presentation of 20 minutes on different outcomes and how they affect prognosis. But really what we're then talking about is the journey that the baby has once it's been born. So the discussions that now have to take place in the first week of life. You know, what should those discussions, what should their content be? What are we talking about? What if this baby has bilateral grade four IVH? What if he has unilateral grade four IVH? What if this baby is now four weeks old and has actually developed NEC? So uh, some of it is about talking about those morbidities and what we say. But yeah, again, if you have any cases, what we'd like to do, you know, your cases have certain themes like culture, like religion, then actually it might be better for those cases to be discussed in that particular session. So Charu, it's really good if, if, if you want to just email me a little bit about the case so mm -hmm. that I, I've got a feel for it because it might be better to do it with those sessions. All right, sure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.